Hello class, this is Dr. Lyons again, uh, and in this chapter we're going to be talking about coral reefs, one of my absolute favorite things uh, in the world. Uh, coral reefs are definitely my favorite ecosystem to explore because they just have so many things living in them, so many fascinating things, and so many beautiful things living in them. So uh, this chapter is a pretty big one, uh, mostly because I could talk for hours and hours and hours about coral reefs. So I've split this chapter in two. Uh, in the first part, we're going to talk about some of the general biology of corals. Uh, and then in the second part, we're going to uh, talk about some of the challenges that corals face uh, and what we can do to help corals. So first, I want to talk about why coral reefs are important, uh, because it is you know, it's pretty easy for, for folks like us that live in Los Angeles, pretty far from any corals, for us to have a hard time kind of realizing why it is that corals would be so important in the first place, because we don't have any that are, that are really close to us. Uh, but for people that do live near corals, they are crucially important. Uh, so some of the things uh, that make them so important uh, includes the fact that they're the most diverse marine ecosystem. So if we care about biodiversity and we care about you know, there being lots of things living in the ocean, then we should care about corals. So somewhere on the order of 25% of all things that are in the ocean, all living things in the ocean, live inside of coral reefs, right? So that's a huge amount of the diversity of the entire ocean, which is remarkable because coral reefs themselves only occupy about 1% of the entire seafloor of the oceans. So only 1% of the seafloor is coral reefs, but 25% of all the living things in the ocean live inside of coral reefs. So pretty staggering. Coral reefs are a very important source of food, not necessarily for folks like us in Los Angeles, uh, but definitely for people that live around coral reefs. Right. So if you uh, if you were to if you were to be a citizen of any you know island nation, you know say for instance the Philippines or or Indonesia or places like uh, Jamaica, uh, you would very much rely on, on food that comes from animals that live in coral reefs, mainly fishes. So a huge amount of the people on the planet are relying on fish that come from coral reefs. So if coral reefs were to be lost, uh, then that very important food source would go away. Uh, coral reefs are important for tourism. So a lot of island nations very much rely on uh, on tourism to kind of uh, help their economy. Uh, for instance, where I took this picture uh, is in the island of Bonaire, uh, a small uh, Caribbean uh, island uh, off the northern uh, off the north side of Venezuela. Uh, and in that island, something like 50 percent of its entire economy is based on tourism around coral reefs. Uh, another reason why corals are so important is uh, is potential pharmaceutical products. So coral reefs have been often referred to as the medicine cabinet of the 21st century. Uh, why people say that is because there's a tremendous amount of diversity of living things inside of coral reefs. Uh, in those diverse organisms oftentimes have very strange and very novel compounds inside of them that could potentially be pharmaceutical products in the future. Uh, we're only now beginning to realize just how many important compounds there could be for pharmaceuticals inside of marine uh, organisms and specifically inside of coral reefs. Finally, one last reason uh, that coral reefs are really important just from a, a sort of practical perspective is for shoreline protection. So we talked about how things like mangrove forests and, uh, and salt marshes, how they can protect coastlines from big waves. Well, coral reefs will actually do the same thing so that they will protect uh, the, the coastal communities uh, that, uh, that, that are there nearby them. So I wanted to talk a little bit about why it is that coral reefs are so diverse. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with uh, how complex the seafloor is. Uh, and by complex, I mean how many, you know, just how flat it is or, or alternatively, you know, how much kind of up and down and, and cracks and crevices there are for things to live in. So this is showing us the relationship between the substrate uh, complexity and, uh, and how much uh, 
how many different living things are there, so number of species, uh, and the total just abundance of things that are living there. So on, on the horizontal axis, we have habitat assessment score. So a high habitat assessment score means that the seafloor sea floor looks kind of like this. You know, there's lots of, of cracks and crevices, and there's lots of little places for organisms to hide inside of. Whereas a low habitat assessment score would mean that the seafloor is pretty much flat. Uh, there's not a lot of places for things to hide inside of. So it's not very surprising then that the more complex the seafloor is, like on the right, uh, the more species there, there would be. Right? You see that this graph kind of goes up and up and up. So the, the more complex the seafloor is, the more species you find there. And the more complex the seafloor is, the, the more abundant the fish are in that area. So more complex seafloor, more fish living inside of that area. So coral reefs are way out uh, on the extreme ends, right there and right there. So see, so coral reefs are very, very complex ecosystems, right? They look a lot like, like that picture down there, where there's lots of cracks and crevices for little fishes to, to live inside of. Uh, and not just fishes, but you know uh, all sorts of things that, that don't have backbones as well. So that, in a large part, is why coral reefs are so diverse uh, and why they have so much life in them. It's because they make for a very, very complex seafloor with lots of hiding spaces for, uh, for fishes and other things. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about the, the general biology of, of corals. So a coral is an cnidarian, right? So we talked about these back in chapter seven. So the cnidarians include the anemones, the jellyfish, and the corals. Uh, and so what all, the, what all of those groups have in common is they all have stinging cells known as nematocysts, right? So if you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, you've had a nasty interaction with a nematocyst. And the nematocysts, those were the, those stinging cells with, that are kind of like spears that I talked about uh, back in chapter seven. Uh, and so on the tentacles of this, these corals right here, so those are, those are tentacles, right? On those tentacles, there are tons and tons of little nematocysts that they use for capturing their prey. Okay, a really important thing that makes corals different from other cnidarians is that they will live in colonies. So what you see here uh, is a colony of corals. Uh, and so each of these one things is a coral polyp, so one coral polyp. Remember, we talked about uh, polyps and medusas. So polyps uh, is the form of a cnidarian that is stuck to the seafloor and the tentacles and mouth face up, whereas the medusa form has the, the tentacles facing down and it's not as stuck to the seafloor. So you see one coral polyp here, another coral polyp here, another there, another there, there, and there. Right, so we have all these coral polyps that are all attached to each other. Uh, and how all these coral polyps got made uh, is they all started as just one individual coral polyp. Uh, and that polyp grew until it was big enough that it could split in half. Right, so it splits down the middle and it forms two coral polyps. And then those two get big and they split and they form four coral polyps. Uh, and over time you have just more and more polyps being added. Uh, so this is what's known as budding. This is, uh, and this is a form of asexual reproduction, right? So making more of yourself, uh, but doing so without having sex, without, uh, without mixing eggs and sperm from, from different individuals. So a important kind of side effect of that is that because these two polyps right here were once one that then, you know, split apart from each other, they are clones of each other, right? So they are genetically identical to each other. So they are really the same individual because uh, they're genetically identical to each other and they're attached by tissue to each other, right? So all of these polyps here, they're all have this, they all have the same DNA, they're all clones uh, and they all have tissue that's uh, attaching them to each other. Right, so each polyp, you know, does have its own mouth and kind of operates, you know, separately from the others but they are essentially the same organism because they have the same DNA and they are attached to each other. Okay, another important aspect of coral biology is the skeleton that they produce. Uh, and you're gonna learn a lot more about this when, uh, when you do the ocean acidification lab. Uh, 
So underneath a coral is a really big skeleton made of calcium carbonate, right? So it's a really hard rock-like structure that is, uh, that is not so different from, from the bones that we have, you know, really, really hard uh, and very solid. Uh, and why they produce that skeleton is because they hide in it. Uh, so during the day, the polyp and the tentacles of a uh, coral will withdraw into the cavity, uh, in, into the, this, this large cavity inside of the skeleton. So it's a nice little form of protection for them. So during the day, they're kind of hidden inside, and at night, they extend outward. Uh, and why they do that is that they feed at night. So they stick their little tentacles and their polyp uh, out at night, which is when I took this picture, and then that's when they're actually feeding on plankton that drifts by. Uh, so that's another really important aspect of corals is that they produce these skeletons. So corals come in a lot of different shapes. You know, as a whole, uh, corals are very, very diverse, right? So there's, there's you know, a few thousand species of corals that are found uh, throughout the tropics. Uh, and they can be in these kind of massive shapes. They can have these kind of branching, almost tree-like shapes. Sometimes they're like little skyscrapers, these little columns. Sometimes they're, they're just in these free living forms that just are, are sitting on sand. Sometimes they just cover the sea floor, so they encrust the sea floor and just whatever the shape of the sea floor is, that's what shape that they have. Uh, and then sometimes they will come in these plate or almost table-like uh, shapes. So a lot of different shapes that corals come in. So even though corals come in a lot of different shapes, one thing that unifies all of them is that they grow very, very slowly, right? So all corals grow incredibly slowly, uh, but there is some variation amongst corals in just how slowly they grow. So for instance, uh, massive corals, like what you see on the seafloor here, so like these boulder, these yellow bouldery looking things, which is the coral uh, orbicella, uh, those corals grow incredibly slowly, only one centimeter per year. So that is uh, roughly half an inch per year that they, that they grow, which is a tiny, tiny amount. Whereas these, they, they grow still very slowly, uh, but this elkhorn coral can grow on the order of 10 centimeters per year. So a little bit faster, but still on the whole, they, they don't grow very quickly. You know, maybe 10 centimeters, that's probably about four inches that they're growing per, per year. Okay, one really important aspect of the biology of tropical corals that you find in, you know, near the equator uh, is that when you look at them, what you're really looking at is two different organisms. So like with this big uh, uh, brain coral that I took this picture of, and this, this was maybe one of the biggest brain corals I've ever seen. It was probably about, about the size of a, of a small car. So imagine like a, I don't know, imagine like a Fiat or like a, or like a VW bug. It was, it was that big. Uh, and so what you see when you're looking at this thing uh, is you're seeing an Idarian. So you're seeing the actual, you know, multicellular coral that's made up, up of, of individual polyps that are in a colony. Uh, and that is a heterotrophic organism. So it's, it's like us. It needs to eat other things to survive. But living inside of these coral polyps and inside of the coral tissue are these single-celled algae known as zooxanthellae, uh, which we have, we have talked about uh, back in Chapter 5 when we talked about phytoplankton. Because zooxanthellae is a type of dinoflagellate, which we talked about quite extensively in Chapter 5. Uh, and... These zooxanthellae, because they are algae, they are autotrophic. Uh, so they take energy from the sun and they produce sugar using that energy. And what goes on here is a mutualism. So the zooxanthellae and the cnidarian coral, they are interacting in a, in a way that is beneficial to both of them. So let's talk a little bit about, why, uh, about how corals help their zooxanthellae and how zooxanthellae help their corals. So what you see in this picture is individual uh, uh, tentacles of a coral polyp in those tiny little brownish dots inside of them. Uh, those are the, the zooxanthellae. Uh, so one kind of, um, uh, kind of interesting thing about this is that if you look here, so out here in this very tip of this tentacle, there are no uh, zooxanthellae. And you will notice that that tissue is just clear. Uh, whereas this tissue down here that has the coral, that has the zooxanthellae in it, it has that brownish color from the, the zooxanthellae. Uh, 
So corals themselves are actually clear, uh, and the skeleton underneath them is white. Whereas the zooxanthellae that live inside of them, they have pigments that they use for gathering light from the sun. And those pigments actually give them some color. So the colors, the, the really pretty colors that corals come in, uh, is actually a result of the zooxanthellae that live inside of them. Corals themselves are, are clear, but what lives inside of them are colorful. Uh, and that is then going to relate to something that we'll talk about in the second part of this chapter uh, when we get to coral bleaching. Okay, so let's talk about what corals provide to their zooxanthellae. So they provide a few things. One thing that they provide is CO2, so carbon dioxide. So corals are heterotrophs like us, uh, and because of that, they breathe in oxygen and they breathe out carbon dioxide. Uh, the zooxanthellae that live inside of them, on the other hand, they need carbon dioxide in order to photosynthesize. So the, the zooxanthellae can use that nice supply of carbon dioxide in order to photosynthesize. Another thing that corals provide is nutrients from their poop. Uh, so we've talked a few times now about how, about how poop has nutrients in it, right? It may be gross, but that's just how poop is. Uh, and so when corals poop, a lot of those nutrients are useful to the zooxanthellae that live inside of them. Finally, and the most important thing that corals provide their zooxanthellae is a shelter. Uh, a shelter that protects them from herbivores that might otherwise eat them. Right? So they have a nice protective home that they can live inside where they don't have to worry about things eating them. So that is the main thing that corals provide to their zooxanthellae. So let's talk about what the zooxanthellae provide in return. So the main thing that they provide is the products of photosynthesis. So they provide sugars to their, to their coral hosts. Uh, and they provide as much as 95% of the sugars that they make, they give those to the corals, which is pretty remarkable. You can almost think of this as a sort of tax, right? So the corals are, the, the corals are providing a shelter to the zooxanthellae. So the corals, you know, are kind of like the government and the zooxanthellae are like the little citizens of that government that live inside and pay a tax to the government. Uh, but whereas, you know, us Americans, we pay somewhere in the order of, you know, say five to five to maybe 30 percent of our income uh, in taxes, the little zooxanthellae, they give 95 percent of their sugars to the to the corals. So they give a lot of what they produce to their coral host. Uh, another thing that the that the zooxanthellae do uh, is by providing those photosynthetic products, they help corals to calcify. Uh, by calcify, I mean making a skeleton of calcium carbonate. Finally, the zooxanthellae produce oxygen because zooxanthellae are photosynthesizing. So they're taking in carbon dioxide, which comes from the coral, and they're producing sugars and they're producing oxygen. Uh, in, the, in the corals, they need both those sugars and they need the oxygen. So zooxanthellae are a nice supply of oxygen for the, for the corals. So it's a very beneficial relationship. Uh, and without this relationship, tropical coral reefs as we know them would not exist. Uh, so corals are very much reliant upon uh, their zooxanthellae. Uh, and it was only once this, uh, once this relationship was established, that tropical coral reefs started to become, uh, you know, so diverse and so abundant and so full of life. So it is worth mentioning, however, that even though corals do get most of their food from photosynthetic products, they are also animals that eat plankton uh, and they use their tentacles in order to, to eat plankton. Uh, and I've actually, um, while scuba diving, I've actually fed things to corals. Uh, what you can do at night while scuba diving is if you shine a light at a coral, then plankton and small worms will start to congregate around that light. And you can actually see the corals grabbing the, the little worms that are buzzing around and starting to, to eat them. Uh, so I, I have fed corals on a, on a, on a couple of, uh, on, on, on a number of dives, just because it's kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, and I like corals, so I feel like I'm doing a good thing when I do that. Okay, let's talk a little bit about reproduction in, in corals. So corals can do reproduction kind of two major ways. Right, so they can do asexual reproduction, right? So that is how they grow in their colonies. So earlier I mentioned that corals uh, do what's known as budding, where a polyp gets big enough that it will split in two and become two polyps. And that's how a colony grows, is by adding new polyps through asexual reproduction.
But corals also do sexual reproduction, meaning uh, a mixing of, of the DNA of two different individuals, two different adults, to then make a new coral that is a mix of the, the DNA, right? So this is like how us humans reproduce, is with sexual reproduction, right? We mix eggs and sperm, and that together then makes a new human with a, with a unique you know, set of DNA from its two parents. Uh, and how most corals do this is through what's known as broadcast spawning. Right, so they don't have you know intimate romance like humans do. Uh, they just release their eggs and sperm out into the water column uh, and hope that those eggs and sperm that they can find each other. Uh, there are some corals that have something kind of like internal fertilization, more more kind of like us, but for the most part, most corals do it through broadcast spawning. Uh, and when they do this, uh, it tends to be in a in one massive spawning event. Uh, so what will happen is that different, uh, you know, each coral species has its preferred time that it will reproduce. Uh, and so all of the corals of one coral species, they will all release their eggs or their sperm uh, over a period of, say, one hour uh, on one night in the summertime, uh, say, something like five days after the full moon. So the timing is incredibly precise. And why it needs to be so precise is because, say you're a coral that releases your sperm, you know, the following night after everybody's already reproduced. Now all of the eggs and sperm are gone and the sperm that you just released isn't going to do anything. Uh, you're essentially too late for the party. Uh, or say you do the reverse, say you release your sperm the night before, uh, then your sperm or, or your eggs uh, you know, are again not going to find any other sperm or eggs, and you're too early for the party. So essentially you want to show up right on time for the party, and so corals in general do a really good job of this, of all releasing their eggs and sperm at the exact same time. Uh, and that's why then you will see, like the day after a massive spawning event, you'll see all of this slick on the water where all the eggs and the, and the sperm are, uh, because the corals have just reproduced. Okay, let's talk about the conditions that corals need. So most importantly, the, the corals that you find around the equator are, are, they need warm water and they need that water to be incredibly stable. Uh, what I mean by that is, is that the water always needs to have, you know, a pretty good amount of light. Uh, why they need light is because they have zooxanthellae that photosynthesize. That water needs to be very stable with its uh, salinity. Right, so corals need to be in non-estuary salinities. Right, corals are very much stenohaline. They can only survive in a narrow range of salinities. You really don't find corals in estuaries very much. Uh, pretty much always in full ocean salinity. Uh, so they need really stable water that has a has a pretty constant salinity, uh, and they need that water to not be very murky. Uh, because the murkier the water is, the less light is getting through. Uh, and as we talked about before, they need the light for their little zooxanthellae in order to, to uh, photosynthesize. So they need all those conditions to line up correctly. Okay, let's talk a little bit about where you tend to find corals. So there's a few different kind of hot spots for, for coral abundance. Uh, one is in the Caribbean. So think about like the Atlantic coast of Central America and South America, along with the Caribbean islands of like Cuba and, and Jamaica, the Dominican Republic and Haiti, Puerto Rico. So around there, uh, there's a lot of corals around the Hawaiian islands. There's a lot of corals in the South Pacific, a lot of corals in the Indo-Pacific. So like around like Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, the Philippines. Uh, and then you have corals kind of on the perimeter of the Indio, Indian Ocean and into the Red Sea and into the Persian Gulf. Right? So on either side of, of this thing, which is the Arabian Peninsula, where like, um, like Yemen uh, uh, and, uh, and, and Saudi Arabia are there. So corals are kind of in those areas. And you'll notice that they're all pretty much pretty close to the equator. Right, so the corals we're talking about, the, the warm water loving corals are only going to be near the equator. I should mention that there are other deep water corals that are found, you know, closer to the Arctic uh, and to the Antarctic. 
But in general, corals that we're talking about here, like the ones that form big coral reefs, they are only found in shallow water uh, near the equator. So if uh, so, you might be looking at this and seeing, okay, where's the closest corals to us? There are actually some in the uh, Sea of Cortez in Mexico. Uh, so there's a, and, and some of the corals there are actually pretty healthy. Um, a few years ago, my wife and I, we went to a place called uh, Cabo Pulmo, uh, which is in, uh, you know, in Baja, uh, uh, Mexico. Uh, and, and there's actually a really nice marine reserve there that has some really nice, very pretty coral reefs there uh, in the Sea of Cortez. So if you if you want to go see corals for yourself, that's probably the closest place and the cheapest place to, to get to uh, for you to go see them. OK, I want to talk about uh, some of the different types of coral reefs that we find. So there are fringing reefs, barrier reefs and atolls. Uh, and fringing reefs are, are corals that are occurring uh, in kind of a strip uh, immediately adjacent to land. So they are on the fringe of land. So you see like in this picture, here is the land, and then these, this is all coral, you know, right along the fringe of that land. So you have the land, and then you have the coral right next to it. So that is a fringing reef. A barrier reef uh, is when there is a, a barrier island of sand uh, a long ways from shore. And then you have corals growing on either side of that barrier of sand. Uh, so this, of course, applies to, to this right here. Uh, maybe some of you are, are picking up on the fact that this is Australia and this is the Great Barrier Reef. Right. So this is the, the continent of Australia right here. And this dark green line you see along here, that is the Great Barrier Reef, right, which tells you something about how massive it is. Right. It's big enough that you can actually see it from space, which is uh, where this this image comes from. Um, I wish I could say that I took this image, but I have not been to space. Uh, so this was taken by, I don't know, I guess an astronaut. Anyway, so barrier uh, reefs, such as the Great Barrier Reef, they form on uh, on these sandy uh, barrier uh, uh, barriers of, of sediment, uh, and, and they form on either side of it. So unlike a fringing reef, which is right next to the shoreline, uh, barrier reefs will be, you know, 10, maybe 20, maybe hundreds of kilometers away from shore, right? So in places, the, the Great Barrier Reef, you know, is, is, uh, is hundreds of kilometers away from the shoreline, so a long ways away from shore. Okay, finally, I wanted to talk about atolls, uh, which are a fairly unique type of, of reef. So atolls are, are when you have a ring of, of reef, uh, sometimes interspersed with, uh, with sandy uh, uh, islands, uh, and you have a lagoon in the middle that will have corals inside, and then you have an outside, what's known as four reef of corals uh, on the outside. So you have kind of an outer reef, then you have uh, like either, either land or just really shallow sandy water, uh, and then you have a lagoon on the inside that, that has reefs. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit more about how those, those form. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about one of the most famous atolls, which is Bikini Atoll. So this is a, you know, an aerial picture of Bikini Atoll. Uh, and so you can see all of this is, is land, right? So all that like sandy uh, bit. Uh, and then inside of here, there is a lagoon with corals. Uh, and on the outside, there is uh, uh, corals on, on what's known as the four reef. Uh, and then there's very, very deep water around it. Uh, and so Bikini Atoll, that might sound familiar to you if you have watched SpongeBob SquarePants, uh, because SpongeBob and his buddies, they of course live on Bikini Bottom, uh, which is inside the lagoon of Bikini Atoll. Uh, others of you that maybe know, know your World War II history might know that Bikini Atoll is noteworthy for something else. So Bikini Atoll is one of the areas where, where the US uh, uh, military was testing nuclear bombs, right? So during World War II, uh, you know, in the, in the early 1940s, uh, the US was testing nuclear bombs in Bikini Atoll among some other places in the South Pacific, uh, and they were also testing them in New Mexico. So this is a picture of a nuclear bomb being detonated in Bikini Atoll. Uh, 
Uh, so there are there are some that speculate that the reason why SpongeBob and his buddies can talk and you know do all this stuff is because they became irradiated by all of the the nuclear stuff that's in Bikini Atoll from from the U.S. military testing bombs. Uh, I don't know if that is the official canon of uh, you know of the origin story of SpongeBob and all of his buddies, uh, but that is one theory: is that SpongeBob and his buddies resulted from uh, from nuclear radiation. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about how atolls actually become atolls. Uh, and and the person who actually first described this was actually Charles Darwin. So even though Darwin himself was more of a naturalist, more of a biologist, uh, he also dabbled in, you know, in geology a little bit. Uh, and he's the one that figured out what goes on with atolls. So how an atoll forms uh, is we start with a volcanic island. Uh, and around that volcanic island, you have all of this fringing reef around it. So the volcanic island, you know, eventually becomes dormant, as volcanoes do. Uh, and once that volcano is dormant, there's no more magma, you know, spewing up from the center of the volcano, uh, forming this island, right? Because how volcanic islands form is by magma pushing up to the surface and, and creating more, you know, rock and sediment uh, there. So the, the volcano becomes dormant. And then over time, you know, as hurricanes and storms come by, they wash all of this sand from the volcano. They wash it out into the ocean and essentially erode this whole island so the island goes away. So over time, the island gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the island erodes, but the reef that is around it keeps growing because the reef is made of living corals that, that, that keep building more and more of themselves. So the reef stays there, but the island goes away. So essentially, when you look at an atoll, you are looking at where there was once a volcanic island. The volcano is gone, and, and now what is left uh, is the fringing reef that had once been around that volcano. So you kind of see that the, uh, the shape that the island had had when the volcano was, was still actually active. Uh, so that's, that's how atolls form. Okay, and that's how I have to tell you for now about the general biology of corals. Uh, so in the next video lecture, we'll talk about some of the challenges that corals face uh, and the things that, that us, that, that we can do to help corals.